So we continue in this chapter on gas power systems, and we've talked about the internal combustion engines, auto and diesel cycle. We've been introduced to the Brayton cycle, and today we're going to talk about improvements in the efficiency of the Brayton cycle. We're going to talk about regeneration. Have you seen the word regeneration before in this class? Wasn't it with vapor power cycles? What was the main idea with regeneration with vapor power cycles? Feed water heaters such that the boiler received warmer fluid and that expensive fuel that you're burning in the boiler doesn't go to dumping heat just to get the warm. You know, so bring it in as warm. When you bring energy into the working fluid for the vapor power cycle as well as gas power cycle, as general power cycles, bring it in at high temperatures into the working fluid. That's good. How about reheat? Did you see that used? Yeah. We have the same concept. Intercooling is a little different. We didn't emphasize intercooling for internal combustion engines. Anybody see a car, automobile engine with a turbocharger? Do they have intercoolers often? Yes, yes they do. Same concept there. I didn't emphasize it. Or also um, uh, supercharger, supercharging engines. Yeah, they'll have an intercooler. Now, I didn't spend, you know, I didn't cover all the topics that we could have covered on internal combustion engines. I just highlight next semester there's an instructor going to be teaching an elective class in internal combustion engines, and you can uh, spend more on those type of topics. But here, intercooling is going to be important to improve the back work ratio. We'll get into it. So what's this uh, image of a general electric? gas turbine. We have the air coming in, going in through a bunch of stages, different stages of the compressor. Then we have these canisters around the edges here. What are they doing? They're the combustors. Now you have high pressure, high temperature. You pass it through these blades. That's the turbine. The turbine's on the shaft. The shaft comes back and drives the compressor. That's how the compressor works. It's connected to the, the sh through the shaft to the turbines. And then also the shaft comes out here and that's where you bolt up the electric generator and you make some electricity. You have some hot exhaust gases. We'll do something later with those. But this is a basic, simple a gas turbine for power generation. Let's say I, I have a helicopter. How many people have seen helicopters, military, worked on them, other things, riven them? Are they piston cylinder or are they gas turbine? They're gas turbine engines driving helicopters. Wow. How about ships? Gas turbines power them. If you've been in the Navy, a lot of those surface vessels are gas turbine. If it's a, it's a nuclear-powered submarine or nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, that's a different story. All right but destroyers and a lot of other large vessels are gas turbine powered. Uh, tanks, how many been in the army? You have a tank. How is it powered? Gas turbine. In World War II, they didn't have gas turbines. They had diesel piston cylinder. But it's been a great improvement to have these. They're very low weight, high power. All right, clicker question. What gives a high thermal efficiency for a heat engine? A, you want to bring heat into the working fluid at high temperature, or B, reject heat from the working fluid at high temperature? Ian, I'm going to go ahead and stop. So uh, way back when, you understood that there's this box, and you bring in QH, and you have to throw away some QL, and you want to convert as much into W. And you could put a dot on this. That works as well. Hey, what chapter was that in? Way back, like chapter 2 and chapter 5 and chapter 6. And now what we do is we explore what's inside of the box. And we've had a uh, boiler. Then you go to a steam turbine. Then you go to a condenser. Then you go to a pump, right? And then we say, oh, we have something else. We're not doing a vapor power cycle. We're doing a gas power cycle. So we have a compressor. Then we have a burner. 
then we have a gas turbine, then we have a heat rejector out to the rest of the world. That's all we're doing is figuring out what's inside the box to make this system work. But in general, they're all just called heat engines. That's the most generic term for what's the box. And so uh, what do we like? We like to bring them all in at high temperature. And we have to reject heat. We like to reject it low. We saw that the Carnot thermal efficiency was 1 minus TL over TH. That equation is so important, you'll never forget it for the rest of your life. Or at least until you pass the FE exam. <laughs> and to make a high eta, you want a low TL and a high TH. So the best answer is, why do I have 20 some percent of the class? Okay, I'm going to try hard. I'm going to try hard to get that 20 percent on board. So first of all, we have the Brayton cycle, and now we're going to talk about the regenerative Brayton cycle. So we had the compressor. You go out to a burner or a combustor, whatever you want to call it, and then we'll have a gas turbine. Instead of rejecting out of the turbine and dumping to the atmosphere, that was high temperature. So what we do is we bring it back and we put it into a heat exchanger. That heat exchanger is called a regenerator, regen. That's a regenerative Brayton cycle. So that the temperature of the fluid, the air, coming into the burner is higher. So we had to we, we don't have to take the expensive fuel and bring it from a low temperature up to the maximum temperature. We can just uh, take it at a higher temperature up to the maximum temperature. Okay, so uh, this is inlet state one. Then we have state two. And then it would have been natural to renumber the states. But because they already labeled the state feeding the turbine as state three, guess what they decide to do? Introduce state 2.5. No. Go ahead and finish numbering and put here state 4. We have another state here. So let's call this 5 and then 6. No, they didn't. They decided to call this state X because it has everything to do with quality. And every X that you've seen so far in the textbook has been quality. True? No. Every number state has been numbered up to this point in the textbook, but guess what? They throw you a curveball. They're going to start now using some letters for states. So we're going to talk about state X, nothing to do with quality. And then this state is not state 6, call that state Y. Would I pref prefer to do that if it was me writing the textbook? No, I would have I renumbered them or something like that. All right. So anyway, there it is. So you still only have four states with another state X and another state Y. So there's six new states. So we go ahead and want to sketch this on our favorite temperature entropy diagram. You still only have two pressures, the low pressure, the high pressure. We'll start state one inlet, low pressure. We'll go to compress it to high pressure at state two. Now, normally, it's heated, 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 heated all the way up to the maximum temperature state 3, right? We'll leave state 3 there. Often, the temperature at state 3 is determined because of metals, met metallurgical considerations, such that you don't, uh, you have a long-lasting uh, turbine. You don't want it to last a little while and then break because of high temperature fatigue and um, degradation of the strength of materials. So it's often a metallurgical consideration on the maximum temperature. Often you can combust something and make a very high temperature. Getting at high temperature is usually not the issue when you're burning something. Think about a cutting torch. You can get it pretty hot, melt wet, melt metal. All right, then you expand it to state four. Right here, I'm going to move that line up a little bit like this. There's state four. Okay, so four would normally been just all that high temperature wasted, but they see that the temperature at four is higher than the temperature at two. Put it in a uh, regenerative heat exchanger. So you can heat up from two, 
for free by cooling down the gas that's coming after state four. Well, what is the lowest temperature that the hot gas can be cooled to? And what's the highest temperature that the cold gas can be heated to? So you draw two horizontal lines and you say, you know what? I could possibly take state X up to the same temperature as four. That would be the maximum. That's the best you could do for that heat exchanger, for that regenerative heat exchanger. And Y could not really go any lower than two, the temperature at two. That's the extreme. They introduce a regenerative uh, regenerator effectiveness. They could have called it regenerator efficiency as well, but they call it effectiveness. And because it's an energy conservation, you have the enthalpy highest at four, the lowest at two. That would be the maximum enthalpy change of the airstream. And then you're just going to focus on maybe HX is greater than H2. This is the actual increase. So if the regenerator effectiveness is 100%, guess what HX is equal to? H4. Yeah. Now, this is the general term in terms of enthalpy, but if it's constant specific heats, isn't that just TX minus T2 divided by C sub P? T4 minus T2. So when you're working with constant specific heats, it turns into a ratio of temperatures or a ratio of temperature differences. So if I wanted to use this equation, I'd say that Tx is equal to T2 plus the regenerator effectiveness times T4 minus T2. What percent of the maximum temperature change is realized. If it's 100%, just put 100% in there again. What does Tx turn into? Tx turns into T4. What happens if I have uh, the efficiency of the compressor is not 100%? What happens if this is 80% or something? What happens to the TS diagram? Yeah, you're going to have, you're going to talk about state 2s and then 2 actual. Let me clean that up a little bit. 2 as if it's isentropic behavior or compression, and then 2 actual. Likewise, if I have some isentropic efficiency of that turbine, I'm now going to call this 4s, and 4 actual will be out here, isn't it? All right. So air enters the compressor of a regenerative, that's a key word, so it has that regenerator. Air standard Brayton cycle with a volumetric flow rate of 60 meter cube per second at a pressure and a temperature. You make, you read the whole problem over, you draw this schematic like we just drew, etc. Then you start dealing with the information that's given to you. You're given the volumetric flow rate at 1, 60 meter cube per second. You're given the pressure at 1, 80 kilopascal, and the temperature at 1 of 290 Kelvin. Just with that information, can you tell me what is the mass flow rate at 1? What equation would you use? I'm going to pause and walk around. Show, show, me, show me how you get these. So it's the uh, volumetric flow rate at state 1 divided by the specific volume at state 1. The specific volume at state 1 from the ideal gas equation, I just remember PV is equal to RT. So P1, V1 is equal to RT1, but I want PV1, so just bring that P1 over. Right? I would actually make a numerical calculation of this value, V1. If it's around 0.001, or if it's around 1, or if it's around 1,000, answer A, B, or C. What do you expect the specific volume of air is at that pressure? Hey, 80 kilopascal, you get a sense of that pressure. And 290 Kelvin, you get a sense of that temperature. Which one is closest without even running any numbers?
All right, there's a few things I really want you to walk away from this class. Who has a water bottle? About one liter, half a liter water bottle. That's a water bottle right there. How, hold it up. Everybody look at it. Is that a liter? Close enough to a liter. What is the mass of the water in that one liter container? Full of liquid water. What would it be? One kilogram in one liter. Professor, I need my equation sheet. No, you don't. No, you don't. I need I need something. Okay, well, I need to shut this out. What am I doing? What did I do? Unable to end question. Okay, I'll try that again. So now, so the specific volume of liquid water. What is it? So if I have one cubic meter. That's 1,000 kilograms, so it's 0 0.001 meter cube per kilogram. Is the density of air about that? Is the density of air about the density of the water? I'm looking at his water bottle. No. All right. So now it looks like this is uh, for liquid water. So answer A is wrong, wrong. So we're going to redo the question, and your only two viable choices are B and C. And I'm only going to give you a few seconds. It's not for you to calculate it, for you to recognize what it should be. All right, so let's go ahead now. Uh, somebody who, some people probably already ran the number, right? If you ran the number, what'd you come up with? 1.04. 1.04, close enough. So I should rerun that now, benefiting from that. But hey, uh, B is the correct answer. Yeah, B was still the correct answer. Okay, come on now, grade it. All right, there you go. So uh, it, what I like to do is I like to point out where I can kind of check myself to make sure I didn't mess up. This is one of the places you start to get a sense of the specific volume of air at that temperature and pressure. Okay, so it was 1.04. This mass flow rate then comes in at 57.67 mm. And I will put more because it's intermediate calculations, kilograms per second. Very good. The compressor pressure ratio is 20. So they're giving us P2 divided by P1 is 20. Or did they give me, hey, what am I going to look for and find an error? What's a student going to do on exam? R is equal to 20. Are you going to make that mistake? No, do not make that mistake. It's a, read it slowly, compressor pressure ratio. And the maximum cycle temperature is, so T3 is 1950 Kelvin. Isentropic efficiencies are 83 for the compressor, 90 for the turbine. Regenerator effectiveness, 75%. Use the constant specific heats. Should I go to table A22? Should I go to table A22 for only half of the information needed? Can I solve this problem with never, ever even looking at table A22? Yes. 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 When you see these words, constant specific heats, don't even look at table A22. It's only when it's variable specific heats that you have to go to the air table. All right. Then it asked for the net power developed in megawatts and then the heat addition in the combustor in megawatts and the thermal efficiency. What's the strategy? Get a table of properties at each of the states. So we'll have state one. Then we're going to go 2S and then 2 actual. Why? Because I have an isentropic efficiency for that compressor. Then I'm going to go to not two, three, I'm going to go to X. 
right? I'm using the notation in the textbook for state X after the regenerator. Then state 3, then 4S, 4 actual, and then Y. That's all of our states. Yes, sir. Uh, well, they could give you the constant specific heats that are not at uh, 300K. They could give it a, a different value. But you're absolutely right. But having made many exam problems and try to get them to do it this way, it's like I want to bold it, capitalize it, and say it three times. Instead, they'll just say, well, I forgot. I didn't see the little four-letter word up there, cold, right? So, but you're absolutely right. If you would have just put four letters, you know, cold up there, they would have to go to the table to get these values of K, which are at 300 Kelvin. All right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to put our pressure in kilopascal or bar, temperature in Kelvin, and uh, that's all we need, really. And the whole thing hinges on the temperatures. Put in values that we had. We had started with 80 and 290. How do I get T2S? We've done that a few times. T2S is equal to T1 times P2 over P1 to the magic. No, a lot of hard work, sweat, tears, learning out of Chapter 6, talking about air as an ideal gas undergoing isentropic compression where you're given the pressure difference, P2 and P1, or pressure ratio. Okay, so then you can make the calculation. This um, temperature comes in at uh, 682.5. Hey, what's that pressure? It's almost too easy. The pressure ratio was given. <laughs> and so you multiply the inlet pressure by the pressure ratio to get the outlet pressure. Yeah. So it's uh, 1,600. Now, if it's not isentropic, I need to use that efficiency of 83%. Whatever strategy you like, but I like to do it like this. I like to think, well, what is the definition of the isentropic efficiency? Well, it's the work, the compressor, uh, isentropic divided by the work compressor actual. You're going to have to put more work in than, than if it was frictionless or isentropic compression. So this is C sub P divided by C sub P. The C sub P's cancel. But it's a temperature difference, right? This is T, um, uh, 2S minus T1. This is T2 actual minus T1. So the T2 actual, what I'm trying to calculate, is equal to the T1 plus 1 over the compressor isentropic efficiency times T2S minus T1. Now I can calculate it. And it comes in at 762.9. Now, what happens if that temperature would be lower? Let's say that somebody making it, believe me, I've graded enough exams, and they come in, oh, it's 620 Kelvin for T2 actual. Look for an error. Look for an error. This is a great place to pause, look at it, and say, does it make sense? Is the temperature higher? It has to be higher going through the compressor, out of the compressors. All right, it still is 1,600. What about X? Skip X for a minute. Sorry, it looks like I got offline. But let's go to state 3. It's still 1,600, but they give us the temperature, 1,950. So when you're doing these problems, you can't always go sequentially. Stop, pause, work on state 4 now. So. T4S is equal to T3 times this um, reciprocal, let me just put 1 over, what is it, 20 is the pressure ratio, to the K minus 1 over K. So this goes from 1950 to 828.5. We use the efficiency of the turbine and it comes in at 940.7 for the actual temperature, 940.7. Its pressure is now down to 80, 80, and 80. Now I pause, 
and now I can say, well, what was my maximum temperature change for that regenerator? Well, I know the T4 and I know the T2, so I can calculate the maximum temperature change. And so the Tx is going to be T2 plus some percentage. It's uh, the regenerator effectiveness is 75% of that maximum temperature change, didn't leave enough room, uh, 940.7 minus 762.9. And then this temperature, Tx, comes in at 896.2, and, uh, and then Ty comes in at 807.4. Because it's a counter flow heat exchanger, this Ty, let me come back here, Ty can be lower than Tx. It just, Tx cannot be higher than T4, actual. Uh, I should have messed, I should have redrawn that, shouldn't I? I should have come back, once I have the isentropic efficiency, then I should have readjusted where the X max and Y is. So here is like the Y can't go any lower than right there, and the X can't go any higher than right there. Hopefully that makes sense. Right? Because it's based off of the actual 4 temperature and the actual 2 temperature. Once I have a table of all of these uh, properties, I need a table of the transfers. I'm running out of room. Insert new page. So I'm going to have Q and W in kilojoules per kilogram, kilojoules per kilogram, and I have a component known as the compressor. I'm going to put burner, although I like to call it combustor, but it's too closely, you know, C for Compressor C for combustor, so we'll call it burner. And then uh, you have the turbine, turbine, and then you have a regenerator, and then a heat exchanger. Now the deal is this sometimes gives students trouble. This is Q from the rest of the world into the working fluid in the compressor. Well, it's adiabatic, so that's easy. But this work comes from the cycle or outside the compressor. You find that it's negative 475.3. Okay. For the burner, you find that you have to dump in 1058.0 kilojoules per kilogram going through it. There's no work. For the turbine, there's no heat transfer. It's 1014.4. How did we get each of these? They're typically just a C sub P delta T calculation for both Q and work. And then for the heat exchanger to reject it is negative 520. How about for the regenerator? Now this is the part where it's 0, 0. There's no external transfer to or from the regenerator. Heat transfer or work. It's it's heat transfer inside the regenerator. Right. When you do the sum, you find this is 539.1, 539.1. What do you do? They're the same, hence it's okay. Good. Now we can calculate what is the power, net power out of the cycle. Isn't that that mass flow rate times the net work? Mass flow rate was almost 60. It was 57.674 kilograms per second. And you have 539.1 kilojoules per kilogram, giving us kilowatts or megawatts. And so that comes in at 31.09 megawatt. For the, here, w dot net equal to box it. Then the other part, which is the burner, Q dot in the burner, is equal to the mass flow rate times. I'm going to put Q of the burner. We already calculated it's 1058.0 kilojoules per kilogram. And Q dot burner 
turns in to be 61.08 megawatts. And then the last part, thermal efficiency, isn't that just the ratio of the two? So you get 31.09 megawatts of power out when you supply 61.08 megawatts of heat into the combustor. Thermal efficiency is 50.9%. Done? All right. You can solve this with variable specific heats. What will you end up doing a lot of? Interpolation. Do it. Let's now talk about reheat. So we're going to stay with the regenerative Brayton cycle, meaning that I have the compressor. I'm going to come out, I'm going to put it into a regenerator, then we're going to come out to the burner, and then we're going to pass it into, let's do it like this, a turbine. But here, we said that that maximum temperature is often restricted by metallurgical considerations. And we really want to bring in all of the energy into the working fluid at high temperature. So what we do is we expand it somewhat, then put it back into another burner or combustor, call this number two, call this now number one, then expand it into a second turbine, turbine two, turbine one, then put it back out through the regenerator and you have to close the loop to reject heat to the environment, so close the loop that way with this heat exchanger. So we call this state one, state two. We'll stay with state X following the textbook. State three, state, this is terrible. They want to stay with state four out of the last turbine. So they call this state A and state B. Isn't that what they're doing in the textbook? Anybody verify that? You verify that? Yeah. So now we have state X, Y, and A and B. And this now state Y. All right. So we have letters and numbers indicating states. Very confusing. So why is this good for performance? Again, heat into this working fluid at high temperature is always good for a heat engine. Always good. That's so shown in the Carnot cycle. Well, we could uh, also now enhance the performance with an intercooler. The intercooler is going to be added right here. And the intercooler. So we've put in two turbines. Guess what they're going to do? They're going to put in two compressors. So allow me to modify the cycle a little bit. All right, we'll put in a compressor right here. So we have two compressors. Now, after the first compressor, they're going to put it through a inner cooler. It's a heat exchanger, which rejects heat to the environment. All right, so let me see if I can clean this up a little bit. Bring it down, put it through a heat exchanger. <coughs> then put it into the first compressor, compressor one. After the first compressor, put it to an intercooler, and then take it to the second compressor, and away you go. So let's still call this the inlet to the first compressor, state one. I think they call this state D. No, C and D. Do they call this state C? And then this state D. Who has a book open? You do? You remember? Is that the way they do it? So now we have X and Y, A and B, C and D for states. All right. Let me back up. Why was this regenerator good? Bringing in heat at high temperature is good for performance. Why are you having a second you know, burner, a reheat? Good for performance. Oh, okay, but why do they have an intercooler? Well, 
yeah, you're rejecting heat out of the cycle here, and that is at low temperature. You're rejecting it there. But uh, it's a really complicated question, and I hope that I can help you so that after you leave this class, you can answer that question. So I'm going to kind of not just give you the answer. I'm going to have you work through it to get the answer. But you've got all the tools to answer that question. So how does that inner cooler help the cycle performance? How does it help improve the thermal efficiency of the cycle? That's a good question. Here's a question to back it up. Forget about air and compressors. You have a lot of experience with the previous chapter, pumps and water. Do you not? How many people analyzed the pump before? Yeah, everybody hand this up. So let's answer this question. Oh, man, I was supposed to cover up the answer. All right, I'm going to do that real fast. Sorry about that. Doink, 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 doink. You did not see that. So I'm going to pause. I want you to answer this question. What is the minimum theoretical work that would be required to run a pump, a pump where you have liquid water coming into the pump, liquid waters, let's not be tricky, around room temperature, let's round that off to 300 Kelvin, okay? Frictionless pump, adiabatic, what's that minimum theoretical work to boost the pressure from 100 to 1100 kilopascal. I'm going to walk around. I hope I can get a few correct answers. Call me when you get the answer. I know you saw the answer. Darn it. So we, we analyzed this before, and so when you see the word minimum, you're thinking about, hey, that's reversible, and it's adiabatic, so it's reversible adiabatic, it's isentropic. And uh, you can recall that the minimum internal, so lowercase w int rev is equal to the minus integral VDP. Remember that equation? And so when it's constant, the density or the specific volume of liquid water is constant, comes outside, it's just V. Then you're going to have the final pressure minus the initial pressure. You have to say, well, I don't have my textbook, but what is V for liquid water? 0 0.001, close enough. The pressure difference was picked such that it's precisely 1,000 kilopascal. This was a meter cubed per kilogram. Hence, the work int rev comes in to be 1 kilojoule per kilogram. That is the work required to boost the pressure, liquid water, minimum work. There it is. Somebody says, now I want you to do it isothermally. That's not S equal to constant, that's T is equal to constant. But we recall, made a big deal of this temperature entropy diagram with the ref prop software, that we're tucked over here on the saturated liquid line, feed it into a pump, and a boom, it goes right there. And you have to get a magnifying glass out to see the difference. And the temperature difference is 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 degrees C, negligible. So, if you want to be isothermal, well, you just have to stop it from going from 300 to 300.3 Kelvin. Come on. It's going to be the same answer. Is it really going to be more efficient if you cool it while you are putting it through the pump? No. It's one kilojoule per kilogram. It's the same amount of power in, work in. Now all that was review for the hard stuff. Because what is the title of this chapter? Gas power cycles. Gases don't go through pumps. When you want to boost the pressure of water, liquid water, you put it into a pump. When you want to boost the pressure of a gas like air, you put it into a compressor. But the compressor can boost the pressure the same amount. Don't change the pressure boost. Let's focus on one kilogram of air. And started at 300 Kelvin. What is that work? What is that minimum work to adiabatically compress the air? Is S equal to constant? Sure is. Then the next part, harder even. 
What is that minimum theoretical work when you isothermally compress? Now T is equal to a constant. Two questions. They're really hard. But you have all the tools. You have all the tools to answer that question, these two questions. So we have, what, 11 minutes? Should I give you some time? I want to see if somebody can do this. I know if I... All right, so we'll take a vote. I can wrap this up in the next six minutes, or I can stop and let you think about it till next week, Tuesday. What's your preference? Give us the answer in six minutes, Professor. Or let me have the weekend to really learn. Only a few. All right, well, uh, thank you for answering part B or giving me option B, but let's, let's, let's do this. All right, so uh, I have the uh, compressor, right? And uh, we know from the first law that uh, the, the, the specific work to drive the compressor, I like to avoid the minus sign, is equal to the uh, change in the enthalpy, H2 uh, minus H1. Here's exit 2, here's inlet 1. True or false? Do you like that equation? That's true. Some people said, no problem, give me C sub P, give me T2, give me T1, I'm done. Yeah, but what is T2? I gave you T1. I can get C sub P, 1.005, right? Close it up for cold. But what about T2? T2 is T1? No. T2 is T1 times P2 over P1 to the power K minus 1 over K minus T1 times C sub P. True or false? Isn't this isotropic compression? True, false? So you can even pull out the T1 and you'll see C sub P times T1 times P2 over P1 to the K minus 1 over K minus 1. Hey, somebody even ran that number and you got it to four digits. What was your number? 290? 296. Okay. 297 kilojoules per kilogram. All right, what about this one? What happens if I compress it isothermally? How are you going to do that? Well, this is a little more tricky, isothermal compression, because this equation, is, sometimes you'll say, well, look, it, if it's the same temperature, then I should have gotten it for free. But what's wrong with that analysis? That equation comes from a CV around this whole thing, and this one had this hash marks. What does the hash marks indicate? No heat transfer. If I start to compress it, it wants to heat up. If I'm going to keep it isothermal, guess what I have to do? Throw some heat out. Do I not? There's a couple ways of doing this. You can look at it from the second law analysis. Oh, come on. What's going on with me? All right. I don't know what's going on. Stop, stop, stop. All right, I've got three minutes. Bear with me. So um, if I do a second law analysis, um, I have uh, uh, Q dot, uh, Q dot, um, let's do this one, plus Q dot divided by TB. That's the heat transfer coming into the control volume, Q dot right here the boundary temperature, and, and then we're going to have the mass flow rate coming in at 1, out at 2, plus entropy generation in the side the compressor. Is it still going to be internally reversible? I want the minimum theoretical, right? Okay. So uh, now I have to say, what is my change in entropy? Well, I just think, isn't that C sub P natural log of T2 over T1 minus R natural log of P2 over P1. So uh, I can write it like this, uh, put a TB there and put a Q dot divided by M dot. Isn't that Q? Q? So if I go back to the first law, the first law is going to show that lowercase Q is equal to lowercase W of the compressor. 
because the if I put cap no okay fine go back to the first one zero is equal to q dot compressor minus w dot compressor plus m dot times h two minus h one all right or h one minus h two all right we already said it was isothermal h is only a function of temperature the change in h is zero but that just shows q dots equal to m dot or lowercase q dot q is equal to lowercase w so lowercase wc is equal to lowercase qc which is tb which is same as t1 it's staying isothermal times and now we look at this part if t1 is equal to t2 what's the natural log of one zero we get the r natural log of p2 over p1 i'm getting rid of the minus sign sorry about that but these, I know what sign it is. I have to put work into the compressor. This is my equation to get the work into the compressor. I put my 300 Kelvin. I put my 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin for my R. I put my natural log 1100, or did I have 1200? Divided by 100. Who has a calculator? Can you run that for me? One person at a time, get my attention, I'll call on you and you read out your number that you get for that. First one to do it. What do you get? 206. 206. I need a verification. 206 kilojoules per kilogram. 206. 206. Now, you compare 297 with 206. There's a 30% difference is a 30% reduction. Why is there a 30% less friction, right? It had to be something with the friction to make it cheaper. No, nothing to do with friction. These are both minimum, minimum theoretical works. So what's the difference? What's the deal? Well, this equation right here, it's your old friend. Whoops. Um, I'm already over time. I'm going to have to wrap it up. But guess what? Go back to this equation, and you'll get to the same conclusion that we just got numerically, but you'll do it graphically as well. This is a very important point. Please try to grapple with it. I'll see you next time Tuesday. Thank you.